afternoon, everyone. Uh, they normally call this session the graveyard session because uh, we've all had something to eat and now it's no, you know, Machis full or he's too. And, um, but you know, it's wonderful when the Holy Spirit moves, eh? You know, I, I had a picture in my imagination while we were ministering and praying for people and, and I just, I saw, and I, you know, you can't see wind, you can see what wind does. You know that you, you can't actually see wind, you just see the effect of wind. And so I, I saw just a, a wind blowing through these doors, but how you see it is that it picks up dust and leaves and it just a, like a, a strong wind that just blew through this building. And, um, and I feel like God is wanting a people whom he can trust with his anointing and with a wind of his spirit to take us into what he wants us to go into. So don't be afraid of his spirit. Don't be afraid. Um, hopefully tomorrow morning, we're going to be praying for people to be filled with His Spirit, to speak in tongues and be released in that space. Uh, that's the kind of, just the, the entry into the supernatural um, elements of God that, that we need in our lives. Uh, he, we, we accomplish His purposes by His Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit in us flowing out of us. That's how we accomplish what He's called us to do. We don't do it through our cleverness or our degrees or our abilities, our charisma. We do it by His Spirit. And He wants to fill His church. He wants His church to be empowered. And uh, it's significant that Pentecost in the upper room had to happen before the 3,000 came to Christ. So there's an empowering of the Holy Spirit that, that, that gives us what we need to go in, into our world and touch it and claim it and, and impact it for the kingdom. And so, man, I just, I just, for you guys, for your future, I just feel like this is a place where, where the wind of the Spirit is welcome and uh, we, we, we revel in it. Um, and so, yeah, be encouraged. Hopefully tomorrow morning we'll, we'll pray for people and see some people speaking in tongues for the first time. That'll be amazing. You know, in 1942, um, the Allies in, uh, in, in the air bases in Europe, in, um, well, in England, because they did bombing raids from England across Europe uh, into Germany, um, that's a B-52 bomber used in the Second World War. And they had these planes arriving home. And they plotted where the enemy fire had shot the plane up. And so you can see where those red dots are is where most of the planes that they had a look at and inspected after they returned home and they said, jeepers, that's where these planes are getting shot up. And, uh, and so they were, they were wanting to make some decisions about how they could improve the safety of their planes. And uh, the um, powers that be started a, a process of figuring out how they could um, strengthen those areas and uh, put some thicker armor plate on them and make it a little bit more um, resilient to enemy fire. And uh, a man who was a, a mathematician and a statistician, his name was Abraham Wald. He was a Hungarian Jew living in, the, in, in America. And he, he said, guys, you're looking at this thing the wrong way. In fact, his, his word to them was, gentlemen, you need to put more armor plate where the holes are not. Because that's where the, ho where the holes are in the planes that didn't return. 
So if you put that picture up again, it's coming now. There you go. So where the holes are not, that's where the planes that never made it home were shot. And that's where you've got to strengthen. So you look at that picture. Look at the engines. These, are, these were plotted on the planes that arrived home. So you can see a plane can still fly with half its wing shot off, with half its tail wing shot off. It'll, some of those planes made it home in an incredibly difficult circumstance, but they made it home. Landed on one wheel. Some of them crash landed onto, their, onto, their, onto the deck in the runway. So where the, where the red dots are not, that's where you want to put the armor. And so he had this, uh, they devised a, a thing. It's now called a thing. It's called survivor bias. It means that your success kind of not, uh, doesn't allow you to see where you need to work. <laughs> and uh, it's quite interesting. I, I thought it was interesting. And um, so some of our greatest lessons in ministry and in life, but, but particularly in ministry and in leadership, some of our greatest lessons are learnt in the crucible of failure. It's when we've got it wrong. It's when we've, we've been shot down <laughs> that we learn some lessons. It's when we don't make it safely home that we've got to dig deep to try and find another step forward. That's when we learn some lessons. And just while we're on that point, I know that a lot of people have been hurt by church leadership over the years. I have. I was injured by church leadership. And just so that we can clear the air, on behalf of every pastor who ever lived, I apologize. Can we get healed and move on? Because you know what? Jesus said that he is building his church. And we cannot go through life being allergic to church because we were hurt. You know, I come from KZN and we have curry. We make proper curry. And there's some of you are, you have invaded this space here. And I'm having some briyani this afternoon, and I've had a bunny chow last week. You, if you know, you know. <laughs> you don't know and all. <laughs> so, if you, and it's possible, because curry is only good curry when, it's in, when you buy it at the dingiest looking shabbiest looking place that's when you get good curry it's got bars and little place where you put your money and then you get your curry and you go home it's <laughs> curry dens are dingy places they look like that that's part of the deal <laughs> better tasting curry from those places i promise you but from time to time we've had a bad one maybe you know auntie left it in the pot overnight and it you know, mutton doesn't like that so much. Chicken doesn't like being reheated. So, but the thing with curry is the longer it's in the pot, the better it tastes. Because <laughs> the spices just start talking. If you have a bad curry, and we know what happens when we get a, a stomach problem, we stay up all night. But it doesn't mean because we had a bad meal that we never eat food again. <laughs> you know, if we have a bad experience, doesn't mean I go, that's it, I'm done, I'm never eating food again. <laughs> Some people do that with church. They go, I have a bad experience. And listen, it's not Jesus, it's some of the people that claim to work for him. And then we say, that's it, I've done. I'm never going back to church again because I got hurt. 
So I want to apologize on behalf of all pastors everywhere. Um, please, we need to get healed so that we can be effective and continue what God has called us to. You know, we live in this tension. This tension is this. On the one side we have, it's a beautiful sentiment or concept that if God, that, that if you can describe your ministry, then God didn't do it. Okay, so, so we got that on this side. Now on this side, we've got what Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 19. He says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. So here, we've got our effort. And over here, we've got what only God can do. And somewhere in between, we live in this space. So we live in this tension. I do believe that if we can give somebody a recipe of how we did it, and how we got to where we got, then God didn't do it, we did. <laughs> and honestly, when I look at what's happened in Hilton, I, it wasn't me. I am not that clever. I was just a bloke who, who, who got very disillusioned with leadership where I was, didn't leave in rebellion, left properly, but said, I'm going to leave that behind and I'm going to press on to what God has for me. And, and because of that, God did something. So I want to encourage you. Sometimes difficulty and places where it's tough produce something that God uses. And so don't, don't, um, don't diminish a bad experience, but learn from it. Don't stay there. Please don't stay there. We can't stay there. We can't live in that place. Got to get over it. Got to get healed. Got to move on. There are a couple of things that I'd wish that I'd done more in my early years as a church planter. Um, I'll just throw them out to you. I wish that I'd trusted God more. <laughs> I think I played it a bit too safe. I mean, gee, you move from, you know, you plant a church, in, you're from Maritzburg and you plant a church to Hilton. It's like seven k's away. <laughs> this will be safe. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, I'll just come back home again. It, was, it wasn't like a massive big step. It wasn't like packing up all our earthly belongings and heading off to another country or, or going far on the other side of, the, of our country. It was a small risk. So I wish that I'd taken bigger risks. Uh, and I don't have any regrets because I, I think the art to good living is to live without regret. That means you bring your A game, you put it all on the table. But in those early years, I, you know, I... If I, if I knew then what I know now, I would have taken way bigger risks. I would have done way more. I would have been a little more trusting of God and less concerned about my own inability. I think I was limited by operating in my own strength instead of trusting God. So, trust God more. Secondly, I, I would have trusted team a bit earlier. We spoke about playing on a team earlier this morning. You know, I came out of, as I said, a bad experience with a team and with a particular leader on a team. And, uh, and so I was a little bit hesitant to function well on a team. I, I didn't, there was a trust issue. Because that's what happens when you get hurt. There are trust issues. And so... I remember thinking when I had my own team and I was leading that I had to try and convince them of what I was thinking or feeling instead of trusting the team. Bringing what I'd felt God had said and brought it to the team without trying to sell it. <laughs> trying to 
improve on the idea so that they would get it. I, I should have trusted that process more. Because the team is always there for your safety. It's not there to make it difficult for you. It's there for your safety. That's how a good team operates. So I came out of a hurtful le leadership situation, a bad model, and so I knew nothing else but suspicion on a team. And you can't function on a team when there's suspicion. Suspicion, uh, suspicious about people's motives, suspicion about their intentions, about their contributions. We can't. There's an agenda. You start on a team when you have those kind of things thinking. Are we talking church leadership, but we can talk business leadership, we can talk any other leadership that we can think of. Can't have a team that's got suspicion. So I chose, I said to Abby, in actual fact, when we started, I said I will never be a defensive, insecure leader. I would never do that because I know what it's like to work for somebody like that. I'm going to be open-handed. I'm going to be trusting. And I'm going to not interpret every opposition as a personal attack. We have teams so that we can talk about stuff. We can together, on an eldership team, we sit together and we, and we, and we navigate what God is saying. And together we decide and we, and we agree on what, this is what God is saying, this is the direction we take. That's what teams do. And it could be that kind of a team, it could be a deacon's team, or any team. It's, it's built around that kind of trust. And so I wish I had trusted team more. I wish I had communicated better. <laughs> Communication is such an important thing component in the life of a church. And uh, I wish I'd communicated my dream, what I dreamt of in the life of, of our church, and included more people on the journey. Uh, I wish I'd delegated a bit more and trusted more people instead of doing it all myself, thinking that if I wanted it done right, I would have to do it myself. That's a weakness. It's not a strength. No, strength is delegating finding trustworthy people and depositing into their lives. That's what Paul says. I think a lot in the life of a church rises and falls on good communication. I think we've got to be on the same page. And I, I love how Gareth communicates vision at every opportunity. There's this, this is what we're doing, guys. This is, what, this is beautiful. I loved how, how Mark communicated vision for the future last night on the video communication. But it's not just standing up there rattling off facts. It's, it's heart engagement. That's how we communicate. I wish I had let the Holy Spirit do His work a little bit more. <laughs> you know, as leaders, we tend to think we've got to fix everything. And we try to fix everything. We need to give the Holy Spirit space. I had one of, one of my elders on slightly older than me and and uh, I was kind of that guy that was going like because no that's wrong and so and so we need to we need to sort that out and he's going like rich let God deal with it I'm not saying don't deal with stuff I'm just saying some things let God do it because when God does it it'll be a permanent job if you get involved they're going to do it because you want them to change and it's not going to be changed They'll, it'll change just when you're around, but when you're not there, it's going to go back to what it was. When God does it, then it's a permanent job. He does it properly. So trust the Holy Spirit to do what, he can, what only He can do in people's lives. Sometimes you've got to choose what battles to fight. You know, run ahead of the Holy Spirit. You know, I love Eugene Peterson's uh, interpretation of that passage in Matthew that says, come and learn from me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He says, come and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Beautiful, eh? The unforced rhythms of grace. And if we can, if our hearts can find that rhythm, and we can learn just the joy of waiting for the Holy Spirit, 
not be in a rush to do what we think should be done, <laughs> but to just rest in Him and let those unforced rhythms of grace set the beat. And we march to that drum. I think we'll do better. Sometimes you've got to wait for people. Sometimes we've got to be patient and wait for people to get it. I remember, you know, you, you, you preach your heart out, week in, week out. And you get one cat from somewhere else comes, and he says stuff that you've been busting your guns off for like months. And then everybody goes, you, that was amazing, eh? Did you hear what he said? And you go like, hello, where have you been? <laughs> can I just say, the worst thing you can do for your lead pastor, there's one year and there's a, the worst thing you can do is text him a link to a preach. So that was amazing. Because he's not going to watch it. Because I don't. Say, so, oh, send me a ticket. That sucks. Amazing. Because uh. that cat's not coming to you when you're sick. He's not coming to pray for you in hospital. He's in YouTube land. He's, he, he, you won't even find him. You can dial a number. You're not going to get him. You can even send him a personal note on the comments and you're not going to get him. He won't reply. <laughs> He's going like, yeah, I'm trying my hardest. My, my jeans are wearing thin here because I've been praying, I've been working, I've been... And you give me a clip for a preach that I should go and listen to. <laughs> it's like, I mean, that'll make him want to pack it in. <laughs> that's, that's unfair. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, I know the pain because I've been there. And, uh, and you go like, I've been saying this. For how long now? And you haven't heard it. We need to be patient with people. I wish I hadn't tried to please everybody all the time. And all of us as leaders, people have expectations. But it's not our job to please everybody all the time. And sometimes people are not going to be happy with what you have chosen to do. And you know what? We live in that space. When you put your hand up as a leader, you put your hand up. We, they didn't tell you that when they made you a leader, but I'm telling you now. <laughs> you put your hand up and you say, I'm willing to be misunderstood and misrepresented for the sake of Jesus. That's what you say. I mean, I, now I'm telling you, sorry. Half the hours are leaving now, sorry. But I didn't mean to do that to you, but... But we've got to be, have thick enough skin to say, you know what, if I'm misunderstood, and it, that's fine. I'll, I'll take that on the chin. And I wish that I'd not tried to please everybody all the time. Our previous team leader in NCMR, Dudley Daniel, said this. He said, never take people's praise or their criticism too seriously. If you take their praise too seriously, you will think more highly of yourself than you ought. If you take their criticism too seriously, you'll be out of the race and you'll be giving up. So you've got to just balance all of that out. Let's have a look at two scriptures, shall we? Romans chapter 12 Verse 6 to 8, it says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. 
There's grace for all kinds of service in the life of the church. And not all service is going to be the same. And I don't believe that that is a comprehensive list. I believe it's just an example. It's a list of things that happen in the life of the church. It's not a complete list. There are other things that happen in the life of the church that, it, that grace is required for. And we should never compare with each other because comparison will paralyze you. Comparison will stop you flowing and functioning in the gift that God has given you and anointed you for. And if you try to be like somebody else, you're going to miss what God wants to do with you. So I think it's critically important that we understand where God has got us and the journey that He's got us on and what He has anointed and gifted us to do. And then let's Let's play our role. Let's not neglect. We fan into, the, into flame the gift, Paul says to Timothy. Fan into flame the gift that was given to you by the laying on of hands. And so we all have, whether we've had hands laid on us for that gift to, to be manifest or not, doesn't matter. God gives the gift. We men, man, the church recognizes that gift. Sometimes that gift is to lead. That's fine. Sometimes it's to serve in various ways. In actual fact, if you think about it, elders, elder, but they're actually deaconing. <laughs> they're actually deaconing because they're serving. And that's what the word deacon means. It means a servant. So their deaconing is leading. So we're all in the same boat here. There's no hierarchy. There's no like, oh, climbing up the ladder. We're all in the same boat, serving the same king in the same way, with different anointings, different giftings, different callings. And so if we compare ourselves with each other, we're going to be, end up in trouble. You cannot all be the same. And you know, you know how you know when somebody's, when that's happening, or a culture like, or exists in the church like that, is when people start dressing like the pastor and talking like the, the pastor. Because he chews gum, we chew gum. <laughs> we even say the same stuff that he says, and, and you can pick it up. I haven't picked it up here one bit. It's because there's a healthy environment here. People know where they're called. And I, I, I run away when I see stuff like that happen, where they're all suddenly talking the same, they're doing the same stuff. They, I don't think that's healthy. I think that we need to celebrate what God is doing with us, with each of us, because we're a body. Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3, says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's good and pleasant. It's like precious oil. On the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. That's a beautiful picture of the anointing of God on the priesthood of believers. It's a beautiful imagery there. Because they anointed priests with oil, poured down, just pour it on. That's how, how lavish God wants to anoint us. How lavishly he wants to gift us for the call and the work that he's called us to. But it, it comes when we live together in unity. Because there it says, it's, it's like, and he, see, he uses these two analogies, these two pictures, like, like this precious oil, and it's also as if the dew of Hermon, which is a high mountain in the north of Israel, were falling on Mount Zion. Mount Zion's in, in, in Jerusalem, it's dry and dusty. Mount Hermon has has precipitation on it, it has snow, it is wet and lush. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord commands or bestows His blessing, even life forevermore. Unity, being together, united behind what God has given us to do and to be.
So there are two beautiful pictures there. This dew, this, this life-giving moisture that comes out of the earth and the air, and it, it, this, this lovely, lush area where growth happens. It's as if that were happening in Mount Zion, the presence of God. And this beautiful picture of this oil running down Aaron's beard and his coat. The anointing of the priesthood of believers to fulfill the call and to be who they're called to be. There's some adjustments that only we can make, and I think I'm just going to end with this, throw some of these out. Only we can decide in our hearts whether we're going to grow in our maturity. We can stunt our growth. We can stunt our maturity, because I think maturity is mission critical for the church. I think mature believers serving the Lord in a mature way, I think that's mission critical. Because you've got people that are getting offended, getting upset, getting knocked out of shape. How are we going to shepherd the, the, in, the increase that God's bringing? How are we going to do that if we if we getting all bent out of shape? Mature believers intentionally laying hold of the call of God on their lives. I think that's helpful. It's mission critical. Only we can grow in our level of submission. <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit can't do that for you. You've got to decide, I'm going to be, I'm going to become mature. You can decide, I'm going to grow in my depth of submission to the leadership that God has placed over me for my own safety. We need each, uh, each other and we need to be accountable. And I believe that accountability is mission critical. It will make or break where we're going in the future. Same with maturity. You know, when Abraham Lincoln was a candidate for the presidency a number of centuries ago, uh, someone asked him what he thought of, the pros of his prospects. With, with characteristic humor, he answered, I do not fear Beckenridge. For he is of the south, and the north will never support him. And I do not much fear Douglas, for the south is against him. But there is a man named Lincoln, I see in the papers, of whom I am very much afraid. Because if I am defeated, it will be by that man. We need accountability, all of us. We need to be in accountable relationships with our leaders because we will self-destruct if we're not. Every human heart has a proneness to wandering. And being in a body, in an accountable space, will keep us on track. And we need it. Augustine, early church father, said this, Thou must be governed that thou mayest govern. <laughs> so you can't be a leader unless you submit it. And even if, when I was the lead elder of our church, I was still under the authority of that eldership. I, never, I could never act independently of that eldership team. Otherwise, we're just paying lip service to an eldership. We go, yeah, the elders said it's fine. Well, no, they weren't even asked, or they were asked, but they weren't given the opportunity. So on the one hand, no elders are cop keeping the lead guy in check. But on the other hand, the lead guy doesn't have his free reign. And they, everybody just rubber stamps what he's what he's saying. We don't it's unhealthy. Next one, I think we can grow in our happiness. And you can decide this for yourself. <laughs> you know? You can decide to be happy or not. I think it's critical for the mission that we are a happy people. What do you think? I mean, would you rather come to a church full of sour-faced people that don't really are not friendly? Apparently it happened once where somebody walked into a church, and it's, it's been researched, somebody walked into a church, and he was a guest, a visitor, for the first time. He sat down in a chair, 
One of the members came to him and said, excuse me, you're sitting in my chair. Apparently it happens. More often than we think, because I've, I've spoken to some leadership teams about that, and, and in most places I go to somebody, you know, that happened to me. So we need to be happy. The Westminster Shorter Catechism uh, is a series of questions and answers that was approved by the British Parliament in 1648. And it was used as a manual of instruction. And the first question uh, and answer in this catechism is probably the most famous, the one that we will all remember. It says, what is the chief end of man? And the answer was, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Friends, serving Jesus has got to be enjoyable. It's got to be fun. We are giving our lives for this. We don't get another shot that we're doing this now and then we get another shot when we can have fun. We must be having fun now. Because I don't want to get to the end of my life and go like, I wish I had more fun. I, I, when we started our church, I said, guys, we've got to be having fun doing this. Otherwise, I want to go and do something else. I don't know what else, but I'm going to do something else. We've got to have fun doing this. And I, and I love John's attitude to evangelism. It's fun. Man. We do it whenever, wherever we go. We just engage. I play in a rock and roll band because, just because I'm a bit of a reb. And, I, and, and so we go to pubs, we go to all different places. And, and it's, the question always comes up, you know, what do you what do? Because do? <laughs> they always think the band's thirsty. <laughs> they always think the band's thirsty. So then the tequilas come and the shots come and, and I go like, I'll just have a Coke, thank you. What do you do? I'm a pastor. What are you doing here? I say, what are you doing here? I mean, why should, the, why should it be different? And I enjoy it. I enjoy, you know, playing all the old songs that we burnt those records to those years ago. Remember? Who burnt their records? Anybody? Yeah, 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 yeah. All those records that I burnt. I'm playing the songs now. <laughs> Having fun. Got to grow in your happiness. God wants us to be happy. Happy in Him. Happy knowing Him. Mark was talking about intimacy last night. Knowing God. He wants us to be happy in Him. In knowing Him. The greatest gift a leader can give their followers is to be happy. Just be happy. Sometimes you've got to tell your face that. Always, you can always see friendly people because they've got creases over here from laughing. <laughs> you can. And I love it. If, you, if you're not happy, don't come and say hello to the visitors. If you're not a happy person, don't come. So when we have new members, we present them in front of the church and we just love bomb them. It's like a whole, everybody just, like for five minutes, people just come and hug them and welcome them into the body. But I just say, if you're not friendly, don't. Because it's going to send the wrong message. Greatest gift that a leader can give their followers is to be happy. Stop. You know, we just need to stop taking ourselves so seriously. Hey? I think. Just, you know, God's got this. <laughs> and, and He wants this more than we do. He really does. He wants the mission to happen more than we do even. We've got to catch up with Him. But do you know what? If we avail ourselves to Him, listen to Him, keep tuned to Him, stay submitted, stay happy in the local body, we're going to walk in the purposes of God. He's going to open that up for us. Stop trying so hard. Stop taking yourself so seriously. And enjoy. Enjoy your God. We need to grow in our love for people. Do you love me? Jesus asked Peter. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Tend my sheep, he says. We need to grow in our love for people. That's the decision that we make. Leadership is not control. It's influence. And we can influence people by our love for them. Genuine love, not... Uh, put on 
Where does your right to lead come from? I often ask that question. It's like, how come, you know, in those early years, how come you guys come back every Sunday? <laughs> because that, it's like, it amazed me that people kept coming back because it wasn't that great. <laughs> I mean, we hacked. We, we had Simon and Garfunkel leading worship. There was me and another guy. And we had like five chords between us and, and a few harmonies. But by the second or third week, we'd heard it all before. So it was like, how are these guys even coming back? And, you know, preaching was a bit of a strain. We tried to spread the load a bit, and some guys got it wrong. And oh, the miracle of miracles that people kept coming back. But what, what, where does the right to lead come from? Well, I think you'll never be a leader whom others love to follow unless you are a leader who loves people. I don't think you'll ever be a leader whom others love to follow unless you are a leader who people can trust. And those are things that we cultivate in ourselves. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that it's got to be the sobering thought for us as leaders that, yeah, we might get our, our permission to lead in a sense from the leadership of the church, if it's a light group or whatever it is that we're leading, but ultimately the secret is people give us the right to lead them. We've got to remember that and honor that. We don't play, we don't, we don't, we don't flop into their, it's not a congregational model, but people give us the right to lead them. And we've got to keep, that's a sacred transaction. We've got to make sure that we respect that. Position may give you power to control, but trust will give you permission to lead. God bless you guys.